Good evening. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Katina Baldwin, and I am the Director of Development here at the Coalition for the Homeless. And I'd like to thank you all for attending and um, for everyone that's turning, tuning in virtually as well. Our region's incredible homeless response system is called The Way Home. It is comprised of more than 100 homeless service partners across diverse sectors, both public and private, allowing us to solve homelessness in a holistic manner. The Coalition for the Homeless, or CFTH, is lead agency to The Way Home. Our mission is to act as a catalyst, uniting partners and maximizing resources to move people experiencing homelessness into permanent housing with supportive services. Well, what does that mean? I'd like you to think of an airport. Our partners are akin to the airlines and that they directly engage with clients and help them exit homelessness and return home. CFTH, though, is like the airport. We are assisting in the long-term planning of our system, acquiring funding, managing programs, coordinating with partners so that our system can move the greatest number of people from point A, homelessness, to point B, housing. We also aim to educate our community about homelessness in hopes of challenging current perceptions, changing hearts, and ultimately advancing our system's work. This brings us to why we launched CFTH Presents this year, our educational series. Tonight, we're gonna to be discussing the intersection of domestic violence and homelessness. And my hope that is that by the end of the evening, you feel compelled to do something, to join our work if you haven't already been able to support it. But before I get started, I'd like to take a moment to thank all the folks that made this evening possible. Thank you to United Way for hosting us. St. Arnold for donating drinks for this evening, Kindred Kitchen for serving up delicious food, Anthony Fuentes for photographing this evening, DNA Studios for um, helping us with streaming this event, and then for all of our speakers for taking the time out of their evenings to join us and share their perspectives on domestic violence and homelessness. And with that, I now have the honor of introducing Jamie Wright. Jamie is an award-winning resilience and encouragement speaker advocate, activist, coach, domestic violence survivor, with a mission to provide survivor-led awareness, empowerment, and advocacy to underrepresented and historically marginalized communities impacted by domestic violence. Jamie has appeared on platforms and podcasts worldwide, including 60 Minutes, BBC News, The Doctors, and even HGTV's House Hunters TV shows. So with that, please join me in welcoming Jamie. Well, happy Wednesday, y'all. Um, as she said, I'm Jamie. I find it um, the most impactful, y'all, for these things to be interactive. Yes, I've had the honor of, of sharing my story on, on huge platforms, but it's, it's it leaves me always in a place of even more humbleness and gratitude when I get the opportunity and honor to share my heart with intimate um, in, in intimate environments like this. So I have this slide, y'all, and it's only um, because I realize that <clears throat> there is power in that. Um, what is that saying? A picture is worth a, a thousand words. So this PowerPoint is just some high level pictures to show you all um, a, a little bit of my journey. But can I get a feel of who's in the room so I know how to meet you? Because y'all could have been anywhere tonight on this Wednesday. So I know y'all came out with some expectations and intentionality in mind. I want to make sure that I at least meet. I'm going to strive to exceed it, but I, I want to meet it. Who's in the Who's in the room? Title-wise, name-wise, anybody? Barbara, you want to go first? Advocate? Y'all are my jam. Thank y'all for being here. Okay, who else is in the room? Right on, thank you for being here. Advocates, anybody else? I love it, transitioning from out of domestic violence or period, incarceration. Thank you for the work that you do. Beautiful. Thank you for the work um, that you do. Showers. Wow. That's beautiful. 
Okay, y'all. So, um, yeah, I'm sorry. L listen, y'all boots on ground, literally. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, I told you we're going to start rumors in Houston. We start, we keep meeting at these events. To... <laughs> I love being with you, and it's an honor to always speak alongside you and Barbie and anybody in the movement around domestic violence. Yes, and I was sitting across from you. Beautiful. Okay. Never in a million years, y'all, would I be thinking that I'd be speaking to such powerful people. I tell Barbie this all the time. I never realized that this was a thing, right? A thing meaning advocates, life coaches, executive directors, that their life mission is to be of service to others, specifically people that's fallen into homelessness and um, domestic violence survivors as my own. So, y'all, the call of action, I'm going to share it up front is is simply um like is katina like katina said is to hopefully uh, for me share a piece of my heart um and my vulnerability to help destigmatize homelessness specifically in um in the domestic violence arena and leave you feeling empowered to go out and do even more good and um hey to see if there's something that you can do to help us in the coalition so before i do that i'm gonna street credit i'm gonna give you all my credibility okay small town girl from southeast oklahoma y'all come from very very humble beginnings very humble beginnings all those accolades yes but i never in a million years would have thought that that was my title can i walk in the in the stream still see me the people online and shout out to the people online can i walk around oh i'm sorry you was eating eating i'm sorry okay so listen y'all so hence the pictures is worth a, a million words because I, I realize y'all that people see me the way that i am now and when i say that i was 13 years old the first time i came home pregnant they're like, really? So I put this PowerPoint slide together. So y'all, this is my me and my sister, my only sibling. Um, That's me when I was about three or four years old, me in the third grade, uh, me when I, my, when I gave birth to my, my first child when I was 14. I would have later on gotten pregnant four more times and had five pregnancies by the time I was 19. And here's a picture of my late mom, myself and my daughter and my sister when I was able to pick myself up and, and graduate high school. Uh, can y'all see the difference between the way I looked in this picture and then the way I looked in that picture? Anybody see the difference? Can anybody tell me what you what you see? Innocence gone? Anybody else? Mm. Okay. Yeah. And it took me, y'all, um, life, life in, right? It took me thinking that I had overcome the obstacles, meaning that the molestation that started to happen in my home, being woken up to my mom screaming for help, um, just like you all said, the loss of the innocence, being scared, being in this constant fight or flight. But but somehow, some way, being able to, after dropping out of middle school, when I became pregnant, graduating high school, trucking along, was able to get a bachelor's degree in accounting, a master's degree, and a good paying job with the federal government just overcoming right so I'm thinking that I have arrived because what else could happen I mean what else could happen I beat the odds was able to buy my first house when I was 18 I beat the odds 
So fast forward. In 2018, now I do have two living um, daughters. They're adults, y'all. They're doing their own thug thizzle. So I'm like, finally, I can live this thing called life, right? This thing I've never experienced. So I'm learning how to swing out dance. Anybody know how to? So I'm just doing me. Bought a house in Dallas. Life is good. So I meet this man in 2018. Fine. When I say this brother was fine, y'all, tall, dark, and handsome. Oh, I do have these pictures. I mean, fine. We went to four seasons. I mean, he swept me off my feet. It was all the things. Retired military, firefighter, ordained minister. So, of course, when he told me or asked me for hand in marriage, I'm like, heck yeah. I'm finally going to live this life that I've always dreamed about as a little girl. The life that I've always wanted, despite not even to this very day, knowing who my father was. Feeling the love from a man, despite suicide attempts. And the first time I remember um, ex being exposed to drugs is when I was smoking crack cocaine out of a Coors can at 11 years old. Finally, this, this, tall dark handsome man was gonna give me love so in 2020 we exchanged vows in Dallas I moved from Dallas to Houston not knowing a single person now circling back the first time that the physical violence started was about three months in it into our relationship in 2018 he took me by the neck and he shook me. And it was so um, inconsistent with, with who I knew him to be in three months, y'all, but who I knew him to be. And it happened so quick that I remember having to process what had just happened. So the abuse, you all, I recognize sharing my story. People, I think, sometimes think that, oh, in 2020, the abuse happened, you know, happened and I was strong and I left. No, no, ma'am, no, sir. It started very early into our relationship, but I thought I was going to pray it away. I thought I was going to hide it away. And I thought for sure when we um, got in one house here in Houston, that I was going to stop. You can go to the next slide. Unfortunately, in April, 2023, I found myself broke, financially broke, broken, Ashamed, hopeless, and homeless at the Houston Area Women's Center. Never in a million years, I thought that that would be my story. But it was, and it is. Uh, I didn't plan for this to happen tonight, but it's happening and I'm going with it. Never in a million years thought that these two ladies right here would see something in me along with a, a group of other people to include my ther the therapist that gave me lots and lots and lots of hours of counseling. This lady right here, Barbie, all these ladies, y'all, when I'm walking around like this, my teeth, I had braces at the time. So my braces was the only thing that saved my, te my teeth and my, my teeth adhered back to my, to my gums at the point that I was like, finally, y'all, I got money to get my teeth fixed and this joker gonna knock my teeth out. So my teeth is, you know, lose. My self-esteem is shattered. Um, but that was my life. Fast forward. And that's the dental team, y'all. That's the dental team that put my smile back together. They put my smile back together again. So I told my creator, I said, listen, if you help me get out of this, the one of the darkest places I've ever been next to burying my mom when she was 47 years old to cancer, I promise you, I will live my days breaking pieces of my heart out off, sharing my authenticity and my story in a way that raises awareness, empowers and advocates for the people that don't have a lot of voice yet. I remember being in the shelter 
and being with some of the ladies, you all, and I only say ladies because I was at the Houston Area Women's Center, which we were all ladies at the shelter. We all know that men experience domestic violence as well. But I remember being in the shelter with those ladies. And I remember saying to myself and my creator, I'm going to get out of here. And when I do, I'm going to take off running and I'm not going to look back. And that's exactly what I've been able to do. I've had the honor of being on these um, beautiful platforms to share my story. I was kidding with Barbie tonight. Anybody that knows me knows that any platform, y'all, I can be riding with you, boots on ground, going to go speak to the homeless. I'm going to bring up domestic violence in a way that empowers the person that's standing in front of me. I served on, now y'all know this is a but God thing. I don't care who your God is, but it's a higher power thing. I had the honor of serving on the board of directors for the Houston Area Women's Center for a few years. Now, who goes from being homeless and a client to having a seat at the table to help the organization shift or continue to do the mission? And now I have the honor of serving on the steering committee. And not only do I get to work alongside Mike and Barbie and all these beautiful people to remind them like, hey, y'all, don't forget about the domestic violence survivors. Hey, y'all, don't y'all, don't forget that homelessness, the technical legal definition includes people fleeing domestic violence. I also get the honor of being the walking, breathing um, tangible person that reminds the mics, reminds the Barbies that when there's adequate, I won't say adequate, when a person has experienced trauma with the right resources, that person can overcome with the right resources and the right hearts, the advocates, the person can overcome. So um, I share that, and I'm not sure what's next. I forgot what I'm going to call. Sorry, y'all. Um, I think it's okay. So I leave that. Thank you. So I leave you all with thank you. Thank you. I have two beautiful, amazing, spoiled brat grandchildren that I get the honor of spoiling because of you. Please, when it gets hard, remember your why. And let's all, even myself, when we encounter someone that is homeless, let's challenge ourselves to remember or think about like the why they're that way. Let's be reminded that the third leading cause to homelessness, y'all, is domestic violence. And what can we do to try to catch that individual before they say F it? What can we do to catch them before they go to the street or before they stay in a, a situation that'll chip away at their confidence or take their lives? What can we do? Whose mother, whose brother, Am I walking past? Okay. So that's it. I normally um, say, hey, ask me anything, but I know that there's going to be a question and answer, and I'll, I'll keep the write your questions down, y'all, because I'm a I'm an open book. There is no hard question. I got enough counseling and therapy at the Houston Area Women's Center <laughs> that my tra trauma triggers are in check, okay? So thank y'all so much. Thank you very much, Jamie, for sharing your story and for all the advocacy work that you do. Up next, I would like to invite up James Gonzalez and Barbie Brashear to provide some more background and information about the intersection of domestic violence and homelessness as leaders in our local homeless response and DV systems, respectively. James is the Director of Operations at the Coalition for the Homeless. He has been with us since February of 2019 in his role. James helps oversee supporting 
of housing experience. He works with clients navigating the housing process with landlords to identify properties that are willing to work with us and is responsible for the overall positive programs. Originally from San Antonio, James holds a degree in psychology from Texas A&M and a master's in social work from the University of Houston. Barbie Brashear is the director, is the executive director for the Harris County Domestic Violence Coordinating Council, a nonprofit organization that works to coordinate a community response to domestic violence in Harris County. She has worked in domestic and sexual violence field for over 30 years and has provided leadership to sexual assault programs, domestic violence programs, and long-term housing programs. She has provided case management and advocacy services to victims for over 20 years. She attended Indiana University, where she earned a bachelor's degree in social work, and the University of Houston Graduate College of Social Work, where she earned her MSW. Please join me in welcoming James and Barbie. Well, thanks for being here, Barbie. Thank uh, you. I think you'll agree with me. The first thing I want to mention is I'm upset with Katina and the rest of the team for having us go after Jamie. That um, That's a great way to, yeah, so. Jamie, you're Well amazing. done, yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, I have a list of questions here that we're just gonna chit chat about. Uh, number one, when did we first meet? This is like a dating game show. <laughs> uh, when did we first meet? What was our first impression of each other? Uh, well, it was 2016, because that's when I started the coalition. Yeah. So this is like pre-Harvey. Like there's like A, D, B, C, and in Houston there's pre-Harvey, post-Harvey um, memories. Yes. What do you remember? They, that. Um, I remember Eva Thibodeau saying, I got a person I want you to meet and I think it's the right person to help 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 this project along and at the time the project was developing coordinated access for the domestic violence system and she brought you to our office yeah first impression was I felt like I'd known you forever for sure that's how yeah. I felt too yeah and then I was scared um because like I knew nothing and you were so patient with me uh, and all the other providers were very patient and were willing to teach me, but I was terrified. No one oh. knew. You were an instant hit. I remember you sitting around the table and at the time it was a work group of all of our domestic violence organizations that had come together to, to start talking about how do we work more collaboratively to create a system that worked like the coordinated access system on the homeless side. And Everybody loved James. Immediately. Everybody. Um, it was the way you were present with people and listened and then even challenged. It, it was beautiful. Sure. I think what I liked the most in those early days, should I call them? Because it's like 2023. So in the early days, <laughs> I think I really appreciated how kind of as Jamie was describing you and the other providers had been telling this story for years and you told me one more time uh, and you were willing to do it I, I I thought that was pretty amazing the willingness despite having said having to have to say it over and over and over and over again well the next one more thing that helped yeah was we developed a ritual of debriefing at El Tiempo with margaritas. See, see, the, is that, that on? Is that, that later? Was, that okay. was the next question. <laughs> it was, how did you begin working together? That and I think it. that's how we, yeah. I've done a few presentations at conferences and they ask, how did y'all build that trust? What started it? That's exactly what it was. Yep, that was it. That's exactly what it was. That was um, it. Then they laugh, and I'm like, no. It really I, was. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. If you don't yes. have margaritas in your COC, that's step one. <laughs> uh, okay, so next question. Why is it important for the homeless response system and domestic violence response systems to work together? Aren't they two totally different things? What does it matter? Y'all have your own money, right? So do we. 
I'm, I'm, and neither I'm, one of us have enough. Yeah. I'm, so let's be clear about that. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think it goes to, Jamie, what you talked about, the, the why. Um, and domestic violence is the leading cause of family homelessness in the United States. And there, there's been a history, and it's, it's a national kind of landscape where home, we're also siloed anyway as as organizations and as systems and as you know um, just agencies out in the world we we it's easy to stay siloed it's harder to work together but it, i think that here in our region we had such a beautiful foundation the dv agencies had uh, already had a beautiful foundation of coming together on a regular basis to talk and then Lending that to the homeless services was just a, a natural fit and it made sense. And knowing that the families that were being served on the homeless side had such histories of trauma and sexual violence and human trafficking and labor trafficking and all of those, all kinds of trauma. And then even sitting with Molly today and learning that she's a street worker out, out there on the street doing street outreach. Didn't mean to call you a street worker. Sorry about that. <laughs> Faux pas. <laughs> Not knocking the trade. Just the clarification. Yes. <laughs> but you, you shared that you had that every encampment that you've gone to on the street, you've encountered someone who's experiencing intimate partner violence. Yeah, I, I think uh, for me, sitting in those meetings with y'all uh, every week for quite some time, thanks to everybody else who was willing to sit there with us every other week, uh, one of them being back over there, um, you know, it was a lot of work. And what I learned was that all of this was much more pervasive than I realized. I felt very naive. What you're just describing, it's not just encampments, it's our everyday life. It's our lives. It's the people we know. It's the people we care about at work. It's it's all over the place. It's not exclusive to our clients. Um, and I think uh, it's been this really interesting learning curve for our homeless providers to learn that same thing. I remember they they keep talking about like, well, you're sending us all these DV clients. I'm like, that's not, those clients actually didn't, some of them might be, but the majority are just your clients and now you're just aware. Exactly. That's the key. It's becoming aware of something that was already there. It's almost like you, you don't know what you don't know until you know it. Right. Um, and, and I think once, once your eyes are open, it's, it's kind of like anybody bought a new car recently or gone car shopping recently and you, you test drive this car and let's say whatever, let's say this, this Toyota and it's red and, and it's like, I've never seen this car before. But then when you test drive it, now you see it everywhere, right? You see it at the stoplight. You see it at the, this is the same thing. Once you're made aware of it, then you can see it. And, and until you're aware of it, you can't do anything about it. So it's hard to, and I'm glad Jamie pointed out that lots of different kinds of people experience intimate partner violence. It's, you can identify all kinds of different ways and people have experienced it. So we're not, not to dismiss all the, all the other folks, but it certainly is predominantly people who identify as female. Um, I don't know if these folks know how hard it is to get funding through, like you said, not enough funding, but it seems it's always difficult for VAWA to get renewed. Well, I guess we should start with what is VAWA and why is it so hard for a president to decide to sign off on it and for Congress to decide to go ahead and pass that bill? It's hard to not see it is a sexist based thing, to be quite honest. So what are your thoughts? VAWA is the Violence Against Women Act, passed in the early 90s, early to mid-90s, 94-ish. 
it's a shame that we needed a law in the first place, right? We should never have needed a law to tell us that we need to protect people from being hurt by their most intimate partner. It seems like a no brainer, right? Yet we do need this law and these protections and the law and the protections also drive funding. And, you know, intimate partner violence has been in sexual violence have both been and human trafficking. All of those issues have been severely underfunded from the very beginning. So it, it, it's, it's, it's really um, perplexing to me that there has to be a fight for dollars when it's a human being's life that we're talking about, um, a kiddo's life. Jamie's story, it's, it should be a no brainer that we don't want to give money and supportive services and resources to one, helping that person get through that trauma, but two, preventing the trauma from happening in the first place, which is not something that we've given a lot of dollars to either. Yeah. And even recently, even so increases in violence throughout the pandemic, yeah. um, and then I, where are things at now? Are they still, is frequency still up or is it gone down, but the intensity is still up or what does that look like here? I think providers would tell you that intensity is still up and incidents are still up, that it's not getting much better. It's only getting worse. ARPA, ARPA funding has made a huge difference in trying to get us to a place where we should have been pre-pandemic, right? but it's going to go away. And same thing for the homeless services, right? All of the, you know, the thousands of people, so over 7,000 people yep. have been housed because of ARPA funding and, and the CHIP 2.0 project. And so when, when those funds go away and we have to resort back, but the resort back is going to be even less than before because across the board, giving is down, um, inflation is up, people don't give during inflation and you know like we're really gonna hit a, an even more difficult time when arpa funding leaves us so we talked about bawa we talked about arpa i think it's really important we well we you teach them about foca what that means and yeah. what unfortunately again talking about there wasn't enough to begin with why yeah why Victims of Crime Act, these are federal dollars that pass through the, to the state, and then um, ours is decided on locally by our Houston-Galveston Area Council, and there's allocations, um, and unfortunately, the, the funds are in VOCA are built through prosecution of white-collar crimes at the federal level, and through court fines and fees and things like that, and we saw under a different administration those things not happening, that those kinds of crimes were not being prosecuted. And then we had COVID, so nobody was going to court. So this, this fund steadily depleted in the, in the past few years, and it's going to take three to five years to build it back up. Now, we also have a new, a possible administration change next year, so we don't know how that's going to impact us. But federally, nationally, and locally, we're going to see a 40% 40 to 45 percent in VOCA. And I just ran the numbers for domestic violence agencies in this region. That means a loss of almost eight million dollars collectively. Eight million dollars is going to be lost. And these these are direct, all of these funds are direct services. So it directly impacts those that are seeking safety. Yeah, I I don't know how to make that any more concrete. Like when I, I just heard about this a couple of weeks ago when we were last speaking and I felt like, how come I'm not seeing this all over the place? Like, all like I'm sure, you know, the other folks in this room that work with those funds are well aware of it. But for me to hear, it was like a 40, 45% decrease um, in these incredibly important funds. That's huge. That's that's massive. That yeah. and to your point, that is for people who right now, this moment, need assistance. Uh, 
that that's just that's just it and and nobody really knows about it yeah well yeah. well now the people out there know these people know so hopefully these are the things we don't talk about <laughs> these are the things that we don't talk about gender-based violence we don't talk about that so I, I really like uh jamie's thought about when it's tough, we need to remember why, because it's very easy to hear 40, 45% decrease. Well, then that's it. We're cutting this program, that program, that program. We're just going to deal with it. Um, and it's really hard to not get resentful and burnt out uh, for everybody who's going to have to try to pick up the slack that's left. Exactly. So what's one of your whys? I'm sure you have a few, so I can't ask you for the one, but a why and then if you could not ask me that question that'd be great because i don't i can't think not of fair <laughs> i will ask you why um it's hard to pick one because i do have several lies um i think from a very early age i knew social work was it for me but i didn't know it was called social work <laughs> Some, some, some people can relate, you know, I, I, I grew up in, a, in, in poverty. Um, I grew up in a violent home thinking it was normal. This is like every other family. Um, and then had the fortunate experience of being able to go to college and get away and being one of the first in my family to actually go to college and then learning something totally different, which is where I learned social work is actually a profession. You can get paid to do that kind of work. Um, maybe not a lot, but a, a living, right? Like, and um, I, I'm going to tell you the, the story of my first social work professor because she's part of my why. And um, she was a, an amazing human being um, from India and she taught social work 101. And she's the very first class, she stood in front of the room and said, if you want to make a difference, all you have to be is authentic. And when she said these words to me, she was only talking to me. I was the only one in the room. You just have, in order to make a difference, you have to be authentic. It just fit. And that, and that was one of my, one of my whys was, at, you know, it just kind of bred from there is, you know, relationships are the most important things we have in this world. The very most important thing that we have and it translates across families and professionally and you know friendships um if i can sit with someone and provide a listening ear and we can both walk away feeling connected and feeling better about that moment that's a why for sure yeah that's a great answer what about you uh well, for sure, big shout out to social work because I, like you, was like, I don't know really what that is. Um, but uh, yeah, I who would have thought, it wasn't until I got older, that I was like, oh, listening is a skill not everybody has. <laughs> Being empathetic, not everybody has it. And you can't teach it, unfortunately. Um, you can, if the person's very willing to learn, yes, you can. Um, and again, I think a very underrated profession because it's very historically gender-based, so it goes unnoticed um, under the radar. Um, I feel very, very lucky to have worked with all the folks I've worked with, you included. Um, I have a lot of whys as well. I will say, uh, you know, for in my very baby early case management days um i was working at this sro and i you know i had some really really great clients and some clients who had a history of all kinds of things they've been struggling with so i felt very lucky to be able to be trusted that they felt like they could talk to me and you know i could be there to support them um and one day uh one of the clients uh, a woman in her, she had to be in the mid-60s, kind of disclosed that 
she was having to do things she didn't want to do, but had to do them. Otherwise, nobody would look out for her. And I felt so incredibly small and naive to think like, what do you mean no one, like, you shouldn't have to exchange anything um, for someone to look out for you when it's storming really loud outside and you need help to you know to, to take care of your unit that shouldn't be a, like it should just be a thing we should just look out for each other and why why would you have to do something like that? of course i didn't say anything like that i hope um i hope i responded i, I honestly don't remember how i responded um so i hope i responded well enough for her um but i never forgot that and that definitely made me realize that like i'm just you never ever 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 know what someone their past sure but their current daily stuff you have no clue um and she deserved more than that and not that anybody else living there didn't deserve it they all did um and that was kind of like the first time i realized like oh my god housing's not enough in itself um, and one of the things I love, 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 love about TV providers is y'all's non-residential services and the mobile advocacy y'all been able to expand and y'all been doing in hospitals with other um, adjacent systems long before we've been doing it. Y'all been doing it. And I just think like that, that's the, that's the next step to how do we make you feel comfortable where you're at? what's the rest of it the rest of your life is still a lot um so it's not just about getting your house somewhere it's about what comes next yeah i think what you're touching on is really key um and, and listening to how people want and need and choose to be served critical right it's it's critical and and you know we jamie you touched on um part of your passion of reaching communities of color and historically underserved and unserved communities. And there are lots of those right here. I mean, there are a lot of them. And it's really important to listen to how people want and need and choose to be served. And, and then we as service providers change and morph to fit that, which is much harder, you, we think, but in reality, it's it's a lot easier. It's a whole lot easier. Um, so I, I think you're touching on that. And the other thing that I want to touch on, James, is you created a space for that woman to feel safe to disclose that, which I think is key as well. And and what an honor and privilege it is. And I think that's another why for I'm going to say for both of us, the honor and privilege to be able to sit with someone. Um, in their vulnerability, don't have to have any answers. I just need to sit with you and be with you and support you. Yeah, that um, something that we try to reiterate in all of our countless work groups is opportunity. Like what kind of opportunity are you providing for your clients, whether it's an apartment, whether it's an opportunity to talk, like what, if you're showing up for a session, don't even if you're exhausted, like just shake it off for at least 15 to 20 minutes to just get through it. Cause you may be the first real conversation they've had all week. Yeah. Uh, okay. So for this next couple of questions, I'd love to invite Jamie back up here. Maybe you should hold a shivery class. <laughs> okay, focus, Jamie. Okay. Stop. <laughs> when, when Chance and Mike think. Okay. So uh, the first question is, what do you hope 
uh, people hear or listening, one thing they take from today? One thing that I hope that people take away today is the importance of the intersection between homelessness and intimate partners slash domestic violence. That intersection. You, you can't talk about one without talking about the other. And, and, and it's a shame that we're separating them in the first place, right? It It's... It's, it's a human condition. And I, I do think that the other thing that I'll add to maybe take away is that Houston, Harris County, Montgomery, Fort Bend County, our tri-county region, we've done some unique things in that space that we need to be proud of. And there's a lot more for us to do there as well. So another social worky thing is the whole magic Right, like, if you had a magic wand, what would you do? And it's so corny, but I'm going to ask it. Yeah. If you had a magic wand, uh, <laughs> whether it's a program or funding or, um, I don't know, policy, what what is something? It doesn't have to be the thing, because there's no one thing that's going to solve everything. But what is something that you'd love to see happen? Oh, I keep this at top of mind. This is very easy for me, y'all. It's controversial, but I'm unapologetic about it. I really don't care. It's providing resources for the people that cause harm. Period. Period. When I when I look back to the root cause of why I was so accepting, accepted, ex, I will, why I was accepting domestic violence and why I was so promiscuous, y'all, like looking at the root cause of it, the person that started causing me harm when I was a little girl was my stepfather. And what he is to this very day, y'all, he's a sexual soul survivor himself. Himself. So when I was born in 1980, and anybody know what hit Black and Brown communities or privatized communities like no other? What hit the community? Crack, right? And so as I'm doing the work myself, I recognize, and I had the honor of having a conversation with my stepfather, just to simply ask him why. And what I, what I recognize, y'all, is that that traumatized little boy, he self-medicated with crack cocaine. And I can't help but to wonder if there was resources available for him to process his trauma a different way, I might, as a woman, be navigating life with trauma, but it wouldn't be from him. And it wouldn't be that because he would have had the tools to process that. So James, this is not a rap magic wand. And I begin to advocate for the people that want to change because y'all, we cannot, we cannot continue to step over that it was legal for a man to beat his wife and his child as long as what, what he hit them with was in what? Bigger than, wider than the rule of, of, of a thumb. That's where the rule of thumb comes from. So in my career, y'all, I'm an analyst. I always wanted to be a social worker, but I understand why the creator has designed my life the way it is. I would look at trends in root causes to recommend solutions to the problem. So as I'm doing my own work again, I'm like, y'all, we can't step over this. We can't step over that. We told, we the world told these people, beat them as long as what, and then automatically expect for that to be unlearned some kind of magical way. So to make it that I get animated about that now, I can, I'll talk to, to anybody, any place, because I, I, I see the humanity in my stepfather. I see the humanity in him. And what I know now, him and my mother, they what we would call now is trauma bonded. My mama had her trauma. He had his trauma. And then they traumatized us. So I'm beginning to be unapologetic about making readily available resources for people that cause the harm. Now, when we make those resources readily available, because I'm going to die trying, y'all. I say this on my social media all the time. 
and we bring these people into the fold and we do this restorative justice practice village standpoint and then they still continue to go out and cause harm then punitive justice whatever y'all it's a choice for real at that point because we've taught them how to do it a different way it's truly a choice thank you yeah i i'm so glad you brought that up i know that you about that as well and that is i think you're absolutely right something that we do not talk about um as a society at all we barely give space and awareness for intimate partner violence let alone uh how past trauma creates environment for future trauma thank you thank you for sharing that absolutely. what about for you and, and feel free to, to add on because i know yeah, absolutely. I know. That. I would say one of the things I would add is safe housing is a right, not a privilege. For every human being should have a safe place to rest their head without worry. And whatever it takes for us to create that, we must do that. I think I'm supposed to hand it over to questions, but I got one more question. I'm just dying. To yes, ask sir. Because I, I, I don't usually have the microphone and get to ask these types of things. So I'm going to go ahead and ask it. Uh, so both of y'all, and I think for a lot of us, uh, through personal experience or through our work, we hear or feel the kind of phrase of, I just thought this is what it is. I just thought this is, this is just home. This is just what my parents do. This is just what I experienced. This is normal. Um, how, how do we start to break that thought process? Because that, that seems to be a very huge root in all of us. Like you, you don't, you don't know what you don't know to what you said earlier. So what, what are your thoughts? I think Jay, it's like having these forms like this, right? Using our 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 ecosystems, our platforms, just to have the conversation. And again, y'all, working on myself, what I recognize is that had someone been teaching me, I have a whole accounting and master's degree, so I have the I know the debits and the credits, right, and the greens and the reds. Well, what about if somebody would have taken the time to teach me as a little girl red flags and green flags? Right. And then and then um, somehow reach the people that were responsible for for my care, which is my grandmother, my my mom, my my family, and then reaching them so that they could be taught like from a black standpoint, I understand that you was beating the submission and you beat your children and you beat and you beat and you beat. But can you consider disciplining your child this way or can you consider speaking to them in a way that affirms them and not tears them down and this is how you can do that and so and so then I'm taught because we know statistics show violence is a learned behavior hitting and to be hit is learned so y'all it ain't rocket science if it's learned then unlearn it but we've got to put it in the places the schools lord jesus knows in the black churches in any church but I can only speak y'all I'm only been black so I, it's not that I'm trying to, I just very factual, right? So in the churches and the beauty salons, normalize the conversation to say, hey, this is, you know, that's kind of, and not from a academia, like, girl, did you, or not like, hey, no, did you know that you could have a safe place? 100% agree. Normalizing that conversation is exactly what's coming in my head. Normalizing trauma and talking about trauma, normalizing vulnerability, like those are the things that we shouldn't shy away from talking about it also normalizing the fact that gender-based violence unaddressed hurts everyone everyone all violence whether it's gender-based or non-gender-based violence hurts everyone can I just add really quick? And what I've also noticed, y'all, the advocates that's been in the movement for years, I want to say I apologize because what I've noticed with some advocates is that you all 
are survivors yourself and have never been able to share your story. And I apologize for that. So that because that what that tells me is that you're walking around with the risk of not being healed yourself. So you might be going home and experiencing red flags every day, like you said, James, like right now when you're in the movement, right? Um, and so I say too, from an advocacy standpoint, some kind of way, making sure that we're supporting the survivors that's in the movement so that when we when they talk about what a healthy relationship looks like, they talk about it from a place of like wholeness and healness. Cause y'all, I'm telling you, when you start the journey of healness and the light, people can tell. I, I, I can tell sometimes when some, when I'm in, in the presence of somebody that's being battered, whether it's physically, emotionally, because I'm on my healing journey. Not that I'm so, look, listen, y'all, I tell people I'm a Christian, unapologetic, and it's because I'm always two decisions from hell and jail. Y'all want me to believe in something. So I ain't trying to be like, I don't, I'm perfect. I'm just saying that I can tell. Anyway, sorry. Y'all not going to bite me back. Am I doing you proud, Catherine? Okay. We can go sit down. You just take over. Yeah. Will you? I, I think... No need to apologize. I, I think that's the best way to end this segment, to be perfectly honest. I think, yeah. Uh, hey, Katina, how did y'all want to do questions? And then, do you want me to walk around with the... And you all, please, anything that you need or want to ask me so that you can go back out here in this thing called life and continue doing the work, I'm telling you, my heart, I lay it at your feet. There is no question that I will not answer from my authentic place. I'm serious about that with my entire heart. And we'll also take questions from our online viewers if folks want to use the Q&A function in the Zoom. Um, well, I learned something this week that I did not know about that on January 1st, uh, CMS who does the Medicare, Medicaid have new rules on health care that are about the need to have social determinants of health as part of their questionnaire. And I see this as a great opportunity for all of us in the social services. Barbie, you've worked in health care already, and I did not know that you had a mobile health mobile teams that work in hospitals is there some things that you could teach the homeless response system about how to work better in health care and how to be more proactive there yes <laughs> so i want to go to one of my concerns that i have I, I think this is an absolutely wonderful beautiful thing that that is now required to di to ask about social determinants of health the concern is the resource depletion that we're already suffering from and now what happens when so I, i've trained tons and tons of medical staff um over over my many years and we, I mean, we spent a whole year, my husband works at Texas Children's um, and he's a social worker and he and I spent a whole year training all the nurses in the emergency department one year. And the, the, the question over and over, it was, it was the Pandora's box. I don't want to ask because I don't know what to do if the answer is yes, does somebody in my, in my home is hurting me. So, so medical professionals feel like they can treat the physical ailments but they can't treat that. They don't know what the prescription is for that. And our answer over and over is all you have to do is shift your definition of fix. The prescription is support, validate, educate. That's all you have to do. That's it. All you have to do. Support that person. Let them know that you're there. Know the resources to give them the resources, validate their experience, what happens to you, the violence that's happening in your home is not okay. And then educate them when you're ready to get help. There are resources and there are places that can help you. 
it, it, it's just a, a liberating thing for that healthcare professional who feels like, okay, I can be the expert in, you know, stitching you up and um, giving you this shot, but I can't be the expert in fixing the violence. You don't have to be. I hope that makes sense. We have a question from Gregory watching at home. You, yes, our Gregory. This is our favorite Gregory. Yes, our favorite Gregory. Yay. Gregory asks, you spoke your why, but what is the how? Oh, Gregory. That's the million dollar question. I think the how is what we're doing every day. And I don't think, I think the how is ever changing and should be ever changing, especially if the how starts with listening. If my how starts with what I think needs to happen, then I've already messed up. If I'm meeting with James and, and, and James is experiencing some kind of trauma and I, in my mind, am thinking, well, James, this is what you need to do. I've messed up. I can repair that by saying, let me listen to you, James. What do you think might help you most? Like that's, that's the how is starting with the person's why if that makes sense oh absolutely yeah. does you want to is, oh. oh my how is exactly just just well listen y'all have some specific specific hows gregory my how right now is being the change that i want to see i've been back and forth with the federal government agency for about six months and they have about 500 million dollars on their books and I cannot access those funds for survivors of domestic violence in, in Oklahoma, where I'm from, where my abuse first started. So my how is I'm knocking on anybody's door, y'all. I'm making any phone call, showing up in any arena with an ask, support letters, donations, in-kind services, so that I can take out a loan my personal self and provide housing to survivors of domestic violence in Oklahoma. I've got to be the person that my mom and my stepdad needed. That's my how right now. Now check back with me, Gregory, in about two months, I'll probably have another how, but that's the how right now. <laughs> All right. Um, so I think right now my how is choosing choosing to come back every, every day i uh you know it's so difficult to explain what we do uh because you're right you can boil it down to all you have to do is admit when you're wrong or you don't know and say how how can i help but to be honest that's really hard for a lot of people um and so being willing to say i'm sorry i don't know or i'm sorry i was wrong or Tell me more. I, I don't understand. I want to. Um, just choosing to be able to do that every day, I think, takes a lot of work for all of us. Uh, so I guess that'd be my help for right now. No, I know y'all not missing Bible study. For I know there's some. Yes, ma'am. My question is, how do people get involved? How do you want to get involved? <laughs> Volunteer, donate, whatever it takes. Yes and yes. Okay. And yes. <laughs> yes, yes, and yes. I think there are lots of ways. Um, you can volunteer. Lots of agencies are open to volunteers, have volunteer training, or ask you what you might like to do. Donating is always a beautiful thing. In-kind cash. Cash goes a long way. I, I will also say, sorry, Barbie dinner, uh -huh. um, in the programs that we have here tonight, we included everyone's um, web page to, to at least get connected that way initially. Excellent. I think the, oh, the other thing that I would add to that is you never know the influence you have in your own circles. 
and the power you have in your own relationships. When I, I say this a lot, you know, what happens when you throw a pebble in the water? What does it create? A ripple. How far does that ripple go? Right? That's what we have the power to do in our own relationships and our own circles of influence is to, to be the pebble, have the information, support, validate, educate, share it with our circles of influence, because what are they going to do with that information? Share it with their circles of influ influence. I feel like that, remember that old Fabergé shampoo commercial? She told two friends and she told two friends and so on. You know, <laughs> I'm really dating myself now. Barbie, no, but okay. There's nobody in this room that knows that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> we are the minority age bracket. Thank you very much. But yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, you never know what you say and how it might be used by somebody else. And I would just offer, be get clear in how you want to help. Like, what does that help look like? And go after, start Googling, you know, and I, what, when you say, how do you help? What, what? I volunteer my services as a life coach. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay. To who? To the domestic violence, you know, the survivors. Violence, the survivors. Yeah. Yeah. So stay clear in that. And every opportunity you get to be of service, that's what, I mean, cause listen, y'all, I've literally seen my credit score go from like a 780 to three. I didn't even know a credit score could be that low. I don't have two nickels to rub together to make a dime for the last two years. So I've been doing a lot of showing up, volunteering, picking up trash in the fifth court, anywhere that I can be in community. So anywhere that you feel like that you can be of service, absolutely. You show up. Hi, my name is Lisa. I'm from West Houston Assistance Ministries. Uh, being a program officer there, uh, we have about five case managers. We have a licensed social worker, NASA, and then we have Sonia, who has been at WAM and has done case management work for, for 20 years there. And then we have about six navigators. They're all very competent, smart willing to do anything and everything. But the one thing I've noticed is that and the unfortunate reality is we're seeing an uptick in domestic violence, right? And they're coming to our agency. And we're fortunate that we have an amazing grant that's a, a, a funder that's working with us through domestic violence grant. But one thing I notice is that when my team is confronted with the survivor, they tend to seek them. And they're like, oh my goodness, I need to come find Sonia. I need to come find NASA. And so I'm seeking all of these de-escalation training opportunities. And I'm having a hard time finding that. What is your recommendation as a leader that can find more of those resources? Well, I, I would say give us a call because we'll come out and work with your team. Um. You know, I think there's there's these there's this idea that you know having formal de-escalation services is is the answer, and and some of that is really good skills, but some of it is also just about building relationships, increasing communication, freeing yourself of being a fixer. I mean, how how many of you suffer from fixing syndrome. I mean, everybody in the room should raise their hand because you can't be a social worker and not have experienced it. You can't be in a, in a social services setting and not have experienced it and used it, right? It's part of, it's part of who we are and we can be liberated and freed from that ailment. Um, and, and there are ways that we can, we can help support folks in, in, in doing that. So yeah, re reach out to us. We'll, we'll come work with you. Um, we have also, I'm going to shout out to our mobile advocate team who's sitting in the room. <laughs> Jessica and Susan are our mobile advocate team, which means that they are on boots on the ground to the homeless services system to provide specialty kinds of services when you're, you're, you know, working with clients that are experiencing trauma and violence. Um, 
all you got to do is reach out to Susan or Jessica and they're right there to support you in all ways. And that's staff support and your client support. I want to piggyback off of that, right? Um, your mobile team that comes out. I work in the streets with the unhoused population and so many of our guests do experience domestic violence actively. Does the mobile team come out to those sites? And um, when my people are in crisis, you know, oftentimes, um, how long are we waiting, you know, with those kinds of situations, you know, what can I provide for my, my guest in that time that we're waiting, those kinds of things. So know that there's only two of them, for, right? There's only two of them. Yes, they are mobile for that reason, like to, to come meet you where you are. And by you, that means you're the person that needs the help. Um, but they're also available for phone consultation. Um, I know that Susan will, you can email Susan at any time of the day and Susan's going to get back to you. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. Uh, um, I don't know what else, I don't know what else to add. I think that, you know, there can be precarious situations where you got the person in front of you right now, but you don't know where they're going to be tomorrow. And the other thing that you can do is say to that person, I have information and I have one that someone that I can call to come meet with you, but I don't know where you're going to be tomorrow. What do you think we should do about that? And, and get them to help you figure out what that next step looks like. I'm, um, we don't have to, we don't have to fix that, fix that situation, right? Like enlist their, their help and support to figure if, if this is somebody you want to talk to, you know, it, it might take me a day or maybe a couple of days to get that person to come here. What do you think is the best way for us to, to make that happen? Is there a certain place we can talk about meeting? Is there a certain time? It would a phone call be better first, you know, just ask that person. Catherine, I'll go ahead and hint to you and then we can bounce back over here. Um, so we've got a question from Vanessa who's watching at home. Vanessa asks, what, if any, are the research needs related to the intersections between homelessness and domestic violence? What do we not know but need to understand? So there, there is some really great, there was a study called the shift study and I, and it was done in the late nineties that gave us a lot of research on the intersection of, of domestic violence and homelessness. Um, and talks a lot about the trauma and I'm happy to send that link to that information later. And you can post it on the coalition for the web coalition for the homeless website. Um, that's the city that comes predominantly to mind. I think that there've been there, we've had a lot of research around, um, homelessness, a lot of research around domestic violence. What we, I think there's the pieces that are missing are what our underserved and unserved and BIPOC communities need in terms of interventions and what is best practices for, for that. I mean, I think we, I think that we assume that everyone fits the mold of lurk, looking and and being white. I mean, it's just, I mean, we've done that in healthcare as well. You know, healthcare and, and the whole pharmaceutical industry was created for white men. The whole DSM that, you know, if you use the di diagnostic uh, manual was created for ailments for white men. So, so those interventions are tailored to that and are slowly shifting to think about our you know, gender-based differences, our cultural differences, our um, identity differences. So we have a, I, to me, those are the most major gaps that we have and in all kinds of ways, not just in the social services sector, but in our healthcare sector as well. Oh, hi. Hello. Is that, is that good? Oh. Do you know if you have something to add, please do. Barbie looks at me and I just start talking about domestic violence. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 
Um, my name is Amanda Parker. I work with ACAM Alliance of Community Assistance Ministries. I'm their development coordinator. My question is for Jamie. I'm really curious, when you were experiencing homelessness, how did you know what resources were available to you and where to go? Well, that's a beautiful question. What was your name again? Amanda Parker. Miss Amanda, thank you for what you do. So um, it was my case manager at the Houston Area Women's Center. Um, if I hadn't, I, I, what I recognized at first was I was staying at the Houston area women's center out of embarrassment because I didn't want anybody to know where I was and through the therapy, I was liberated and I just continued to stay because I was getting empowered. And so I say that to say, had I not been at the Houston area women's center, like in a shelter, I wouldn't have had no clue because that's my background, my background is to be hid in the hid and that's da, da 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 but through the case manager there at the shelter is how I knew and then when I was at the shelter I started because I'm clinically diagnosed with bipolar 2 and major depression disorder and so when I start getting manic and feeling wonky um because that that trauma you can't just rip that trauma out y'all you know so when I started feeling wonky I volunteer and so I started volunteering in the in the in the community and as I, was, as I was volunteering and still as I volunteer in the community, I just tell, you know, how we as some people like to shop, like, oh, that's a good sale over there. I do the same thing about domestic violence awareness and resources. So literally it was only because I went into the shelter that I understand the resources. And that was through my case manager that I had when I was at the shelter. How'd you know about the shelter? Oh, that's, oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Barbie. See, um, so when, when I called 911 and the sheriff's, uh, the constable responded, um, they gave me a booklet and uh, I just started calling numbers, y'all, because I didn't have any, like, I didn't have any money, so I couldn't go to a hotel and I definitely couldn't go back to Dallas because my face is all, so the the sheriff's office gave me the book booklet of resources and I just started calling them. And, um, this is another reason why I'm unapologetic y'all about doing the work. They, the Houston area women's center, I called all the shelters and none of them was all of it was full. And the Houston area women's center told me to call back a call back. And they said, if you can climb on the top bump, you can come. We have space for you. And I'm like, yeah. So when I, when I got to the shelter and the next day I woke up and as I continued to be there, I seen why my, my bunk mate, she couldn't climb the, the stairs as she, as she had. Um, so it was the, the very responsive, um, constables that came out, I think it was precinct three that came out and responded to the 911 call. And y'all, of course, I was staying at home with my fine husband. So I was like, y'all leave. We're going to pray about it. And we called our, uh, we had a Zoom call with the, my pastor, our pastor at the time. And the my pastor was like, he seen my face and he was like, you're not safe. Like, what's going on here? You know, I'm like, no, we're going to shut up and I'm not in a way and I'm going to be fine. That's speaking in tongues in the, yeah. <laughs> Um, help me, Lord. So yeah, it was the constables that re response responded with the booklet. Did your can I can I ask her a question? Do you, can I ask you a question? You, did yeah. did your did your pastor encourage you to leave? Absolutely, he did. I just didn't know. I did not know if he would have said stay. I absolutely would have stayed. I would have stayed for multiple reasons. I had nowhere to go. I love my husband. I wanted my marriage. And the person that I looked up to the most, which was my my biblical counsel, counseled me and told me to stay. So I absolutely would have stayed, Barbie. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's so important. It does, yeah. Absolutely. So T Texas Council on Family Violence did a study many years ago. I bet it's been 20 years ago now. It's been a long time ago. And they surveyed over 1,200 respondents, phone call surveys, and found that the first place that people reach out to help, friends and family, the next place, their church, their minister, their spiritual leader, right? So what happens if that friends or family or that spiritual leader gives advice to stay or doesn't use that opportunity to support 
validate, educate, right? It's, it's, yeah, victim shaming. It can be devastating, right? I definitely, there was definitely a risk I would have lost my life. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. I would not be here. And if I was here, y'all, I would not be in this capacity. No doubt about that. Thank you for asking that. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm open book, y'all, because I'm telling you, I'm dying on on this in this movement with y'all, and and the power of Brene Brown and in my prayers, I have no shame, no more. Y'all know Brene Brown? Any Brene Brown fans? Uh, we have an anonymous attendee who asks, "Are there any trainings you would recommend for clinicians that work with domestic violence and interpersonal violence?" Heck yeah, Thesha Jenkins from the Harris County Domestic Violence Coordinating Council. Y'all, this lady, man, yes, Thesha Jenkins, she's on Facebook. She's in the community. She's very um, authentic. She's very um, knowledgeable. She's funny. She's studied. I would say that if we know that one out of every three women will experience intimate partner violence, one out of every seven men will experience violence, how many of those people are going to interface with a counselor at some point in their life, right? If that counselor doesn't have basic information about safety planning and assessing for risk, I don't think that's good counseling. That's, that's my personal opinion. Um, I think it should be critical that anyone that is um, providing a clinical service, they should have basic safety planning and risk assessment information. All right, we are going to wind down. I'm going to pass the mic to Mike <laughs> and um, he'll close us out. Thank you guys so much for participating this evening. We really appreciate it. I'll stay here for just a minute. I appreciate it. Um, I don't know if it's the uh, if it's the topic or my age, but I feel very emotional right now. Um, one thing is I look over the past five years, I can't imagine anything else where you learn so much. I mean, every day is this huge learning experience, yes, about human beings, but also about how to be a better person. Uh, how to do your job better. And tonight we really had an opportunity to be educated by some brilliant people who are, who I love, um, who are just nice people, who are good people. Um, James, Barbie, and Jamie are people who um, really have their heart and their work and their brains and their work. And uh, which I'm just feel very fortunate and touched to not only have this evening with you, but also to have these last five years with you. So thank you very much. Um, uh, to the audience, uh, I appreciate you being here. I know it's a big effort to come out in an evening. Um, I think we learn a lot from each other. This is the second um, CFTH education presents and i'm sure there'll be more um i'm really glad for the people who are online and for all of you who are here um i think this 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 um opportunity will grow for all of us uh, do i wish there were a thousand people here absolutely but we'll be those pebbles in the water going forward um and the last is i learned what i'm thinking about all i learned tonight um, you know, Jamie, what you said, and you said it so quickly about the need to bring resources to the perpetrators is a, is a huge deal, a huge deal. And, um, I'd like you to have that magic wand for a lot of reasons. I think the world would be a better place. Um, but th these are things that you learned, um, this, this issue about how I, I've been at, at this five years. And I've never asked the question how the domestic violence coordinating council, how the systems in Houston began to work together. 
Um, now, I know, you know, James Gonzalez was the guy I always turned to when I had questions, but I never asked him that question about how we begin to work together. And I will say there are communities all over the country that want to know how Houston collaborates so well. And I think part of it you got to see tonight. So I want to thank you for being here. Uh, Katina, um, excuse me. <laughs> Always the margaritas. <laughs> Katina, Catherine, Frida, uh, uh, your whole team, thank you for all you've done. Uh, putting this together. This is, I, I consider this a real success because of what we've all gotten to learn tonight. So I look forward to more learnings like this. Thank you so much.